This is Inside the Tour in association with Vodafone, lead partner of the British and Irish Lions. I'm Alistair Eakin, Lions fanatic and rugby commentator. I plan to stay connected to this summer's tour with the official Lions app powered by Vodafone. Hello and welcome to our Inside the Tour online event. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. I'm Ali Eakin and uh, I'm delighted to say that this evening is brought to you in partnership with the My Name is Doddy Foundation, the brilliant organisation uh, set up by the legendary Scotland and British Lions lock forward Doddy Weir to help find a cure for MND and to provide funds for those suffering from it. Um, if at any stage of this event, by the way, we're indeed after it, you would like to donate to the foundation, you'll find the web address at the bottom of the screen. And uh, we very much hope that you will feel able to do that as a gesture. There's no ticketing for this evening, uh, but a donation will be enormously well received. So thank you very much in advance for that. So very, very exciting uh, to be here with you all tonight and to be able to turn our podcast series Inside the Tour, The Lions of 97, into something a little bit more uh, meaningful or certainly more live um, to reflect on those glory days of 97, of course, and to turn our attentions to the current Lions Tour of South Africa, which is so brilliantly set up after the first test victory for Warren Gatlin's men last Saturday, just like in 1997, 1-0 up going into the second test. Now, if you haven't listened to the podcast, uh, there are all 10 episodes uh, available to download now from all your usual podcast platforms. We're indebted to Audi for their support in publishing the podcast, to uh, Vodafone similarly, who are our exclusive sponsors across uh, Britain and Ireland. And again, you can, you can follow and subscribe to the podcast. Uh, the link should be coming across the bottom of your screens through the course of this next hour or so. We'd love you to get stuck into the pod. It is Brilliantly crafted, though I say it myself, I haven't done the crafting. Jonathan Overend and his brilliant production team at 9419 are responsible for that. So many fascinating behind-the-scenes stories. Um, lots of them you will know, and lots of them you really, really won't. I promise you that much. So forgive all the housekeeping. I'm long overdue an introduction of our brilliant guests. So first and foremost, um, we're going to say a big hello to the man, the myth, the legend, with any luck, if his internet connectivity is going to hold up, the man who catapulted himself into many of our lives back in 1997, it's Doddy Weir himself. Doddy, are you there? Thank you so much oh, for uh, spending time yeah. with us tonight. Um, yeah, lovely to be with you. Thank you so much for asking. <laughs> Fingers crossed my internet will hold up. I'm on the top of a hill in the middle of nowhere. So with any luck, lovely to join you and your other guests this evening. We are so thrilled you can be with us, Doddy. Thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, we'll get your thoughts on, on 97 and indeed the current tour in just a minute. Let's also introduce now uh, one of the all-time great Lions, a man who captained the Lions on two successive tours, unbeaten in those two series in Australia and in New Zealand in 2013 and 2017. Sam Warburton is with us. Sam, how are you? And how are you enjoying uh, this com this commentary that you're involved in at the moment? Yeah, I'm, I'm good, thanks, Ali. I'm a lot more pain-free than I was four years ago. So uh, this time four years ago, I was strapped up from head to toe, and now I'm uh, I'm nice and pain-free, enjoying it from a nice comfy seat instead, but still loving the tour. You know, absolutely brilliant to, to cover it. Um, and it's been a privilege to watch the boys do so well. So it's been great. Fantastic. So good to have you. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled to say we also have a man on the inside, which is fitting, really, given that the podcast is called Inside the Tour. From the heart of South Africa, uh, a man uniquely placed for our purposes this evening, an integral part of the Lions series win in 1997. Uh, the starting fly half on that tour, now playing a pivotal coaching role on the current tour. It's Gregor Townsend. Gregor, Join us from South Africa. Thank you so much for being with us. You are a very, very busy man. And we're not going to keep you for the entire hour because you have important business to attend to. But it's lovely to see you. And how are you enjoying it all? Yeah, good evening. Uh, it's It has been enjoyable. Uh, right from the the meetup in Jersey, the two 10 days we had out there, and then to our experiences in South Africa, uh, just seeing the the guys bond together, uh, seeing how well they play, uh, how well they train, and also seeing what's ahead of us. Like uh, the result uh, last Saturday has set us up for a for a great game this weekend, and obviously a great test series. 
Yeah, we'll, we'll get into all of that in a moment or two. It must be really, really exciting where you are right now. Imagine a lot of nervous energy, but but good energy too, given all the belief that should be should be flooding through the ranks. One more man to join us tonight, and uh, an important one. He was front and centre in 1997, front and centre of the drama, the excitement, the try scoring as well. Um, and he was essential to us, I must say, and thank you to him in the making of the podcast. He is minus his handy cam tonight, which is probably a good thing, um, but he still has all the same mischief about him. Uh, it is John Bentley. Bentos, where are you? Come in. Hey, uh, Amir Ali, what a, what a <laughs> privilege to be amongst such such heritage and royalty with rugby. Uh, just listen to Sam there talking about how tough it was four years ago. Um, you need to have a look about how I spent the trip in New Zealand. I, I spent three and a half weeks drinking, so... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I can, I can, I can imagine that scene pretty clearly. I think, um, and obviously, Bentos, you, you know, probably better than most, the, the feelings of those players right now as we build up towards the second test. You, of course, were drafted in, weren't you, for the second test in 1997? You know that that excitement is is tempered with quite a lot of trepidation. I'm guessing. Yeah. I, I... I mean, there are three changes. Gregor and Gats and the coaching team have made three changes for this coming weekend. But um, there was only one change in nice. And funny enough, I was with the Iron last night and uh, Jonathan Davis up at Headingley. Uh, and we were talking about this week ahead. Uh, obviously, it's a month behind. We were a month earlier, uh, 24 years ago, so long ago. But, yeah, it's just, it's it becomes a long week, Ali. You know, it drags on and it drags on, and it's all about kickoff time. It's all about game time, and you just can't wait to go onto the field. And I'm sure we're going to talk about our trip in '97 on Forest with the forthcoming um, game this 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 weekend. Greg Greg was part of that in '97. We were actually second best, Ali, for for for, for 80 minutes of the game. We were probably second best overall. Um, uh, they scored three tries, as, as I've said before. One of them was my fault, a missed tackle. Uh, you just had the vessel and scored another, and Tate would probably take the blame for the other. But Jenks kept us in the game um, up until the last three or four minutes. And then, of course, your man dropped the drop goal. But, yeah, it was it was unbelievable, really. Yeah, it was very, very tense, wasn't it? And and we're expecting more of that on Saturday. Um, Doddy, let's talk to you because we only have you for a short time. Very busy man. Um, I want to know how you're enjoying this current tour. And particularly, I want to know your thoughts on on watching all those Scotsmen thrive. You know, the likes of, of Stuart Hogg and Chris Harris now included, Ali Price, Sunderland, Va- uh, Sutherland and uh, Van der Merver as well, Hamish Watson. How are you enjoying seeing all those boys cut loose? Uh, Ali is lovely for his scores rugby. Gregor did a great job getting them all included. Well, did them and they're playing, certainly they're playing their part at the moment to do what we want them to do is win. Because as Brento said, it doesn't really matter how you play as long as you win at the end of the game. And looking back, we win. I followed Sam Stewart in New Zealand four years ago, and I think what we can say it's very exciting being a player, a great honour being a player in the tour. But I say supporting the tour is quite phenomenal with the most amazing time. Met a lot of lovely friends. I don't know if the players will miss the supporters. We certainly come back four years ago. There were thousands and thousands of supporters listening to John Bentley talk about his one try. He scored. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't mention about the t- the, 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 the tackle that he missed in the second test. All about the one try. But it's this. What a great time it was, Ali. Um, well, yeah. It's uh, lovely to watch it. Great to see the Scots in the team. But what's more important is Greg is going to be under a bit of pressure next year because in the past, when the Scots <laughs> rugby team, I've had so many other tours that we were known to do great things in the Six Nations. <laughs> so what a pressure. 
It's up to you now, Gregor. Good luck, my friend. <laughs> it's up to you, Gregor. <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They'll gain a lot for this experience, um, and they were really competitive this year. So, uh, why not next year? Um, Dolly, can can I ask you about the um, the kind of bonding that that Gregor was talking about in advance of this trip? Obviously, they were in Jersey. You guys were in Weybridge in '97, and you really managed to foster that sort of band of brothers feel, didn't you, in the camp? Um, do, do you think that might be quite a lot harder to? to achieve, obviously, because of the COVID situation in South Africa. There were slightly fewer opportunities for mischief, I'm reckoning, don't you think? I read my mind there, and I was going to love you to ask you that. The biggest thing about every live school is how do the Scots, the Welsh, and the Irish get on with the English? You know, it's a bit bonding, <laughs> trying to get them together. So I played with the guy, I tried to get them to join them for lunch and tea and get them to speak to each other. But on a serious note, with us, with John Bentley at the helm, it was always going to be a good time. It was amazing how we bonded in different ways, stupidity, quite a bit, you could see that in the camera. But amazing, you know, and you can get all notes, and we all know that the best team that they play is those that play together and with us, drink had quite a bit to do with it, different as well. Getting out the hotel, getting up to a little bit with you, which again, John Bentley was heavily involved. He was a social convener. But with Gaga and the team nowadays, I don't know what it was like in New Zealand, but with the COVID restrictions, I would imagine it would be quite difficult uh, to get out in the boat. And I think that makes the team preparation a lot harder. But nowadays, it was very similar. We all got very well done with Weavers. Everyone got together. But I think with that as well, with a lot of respect for the manager, Van Cotton in 97. Uh, Jim Delva and Ian McGeegan, they've been there soon and done it. I think with this two as well, you can see that all the players are getting around the coaches with their total respect on what's been up there and what they're doing. And you can see that the way that they're playing and long may it continue. And really, I hope that Gregor comes back of this tour learning something about red wine. <laughs> so, Greg, I've got, I got questions, I got questions wine tonight. for you. We've got questions for you then from Doddy, haven't we? Um, question one, how, how much mischief have you and the rest of the playing squad been able to get up to, if any? And secondly, how is your red wine education coming along? Uh, there's almost zero mischief. Um, if you know what mischief means, uh, because we've we've been uh, with, with ourselves, we've not been in any um, pub nightclub um, since we met up. Uh, we we did have a few nights in Jersey where we came together, went to a restaurant um, on our own, had a few drinks. Uh, we had a, a couple of nights in the team room um, when we were, we were drinking together, so that there was good crack. Uh, but it's it's within the group of what thirty seven players and about the same number of management, and it's it's been great to see how that has um, evolved. It's it's been fun. Uh, Gats, as, as Sam will know, is a very relaxed coach. He he he, he wants the environment to um, be relaxed, and if that means that you can have a couple of drinks then you can do that. There'll be certain nights where it's it's probably encouraged to to come together and have a few drinks. Last Tuesday night, uh, those that weren't selected for the 23 for the first test um, got together in the bar at the hotel there, had a, had a few drinks, had uh, some good fun together, and I think it was a curfew around 12 or 1 in the morning, but they felt that was, that was good to let off steam and enjoy each other's company. The same thing happened last night, so... Yeah, I think he's he's got a formula 
on and off the field that has proved to be really successful with the Lions. And a part of that is, is bonding, uh, having fun, having having a couple of drinks. Uh, but it's all been within the conf- confines of our hotel and, and the group that we have here. No need for the uh, mistaken identity line then, Doddy, by the sounds of things. <laughs> <laughs> no, they still have them. I find it quite hard for them in today's game because I've really enjoyed the social aspect of what it's all about. It's like having a dinner party with everyone drinking soda water. It's just not for me, you know. I'm a great believer in the old days. I know the game has changed, but the best thing that brought us all together and the way that we bonded was the social side before the game and after. Because at the end of the day, the players at this level are going to have to do battle and you need to have your mate with you, your wingman to help you. And I definitely find it a lot easier when you do a lot of socialising. But I take my hat off to Gregor. He was a phenomenal player. Now he's shown his, his time as a very impressive coach as well. But a terrible, terrible Terrible. Man. Terrible drinker. That was going to say. <laughs> terrible, terrible drinker. <laughs> well, actually, I was joking with Gats last night because we were having um, uh, we were having a few drinks and. Uh, the, the the management have been getting fined and uh, I was sick with Marco Vunipola he said instead of the management have to get haircuts or, or th- something stupid to do now um, you're just going to have a boat race at the end of the uh, the tour <laughs> and you'll just keep going around till someone falls over and I said to guards last night remember when Doddy got us to have a boat race you and I um, before the <laughs> Scotland Wales game for the Doddy Weir Cup the night before and uh, I came in second to Gats, as I'm sure, Sam, you're, you're not surprised by that. <laughs> Gregor, Gregor okay. you did not just go for second. You came in a week later. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, just I finished it, though. I finished that pint of Guinness. If I may say to you, Gregor, there's nothing to be ashamed for coming second now and again. It's quality. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Sam, just before we we, we leave uh, Doddy to the rest of his evening, um, can, can you give us a, a, a slightly younger players' um, version of events for, from '97? The sort of impact that that tour had on you, watching watching these three in action, and and what it did in terms of inspiring you to, to crack on with your career. Yeah, without doubt. By the way, I think a boat race between me and Gregor would be it would be long and laboured, but it would be fascinating to see who'd win. I think because I'm probably just as bad if not worse a drinker than Gregor and all the boys could vouch for that it was on the tour um oh the 97 tour was it, it was it was pioneering really in the sense of getting Lions as the brand and almost like this mythical team which was kind of not not in the shadows before but I think that DVD or v- VCR <laughs> but made everyone realize crikey this this is unbelievable I remember it was at my friend's house who was an avid rugby fan and I was only when the tour happened, I was only nine, uh, eight, eight or nine. So I didn't really appreciate the tour then. It was probably when I was about 10 or 11 uh, when there was the build-up to the 2001 tour. Then obviously everyone was reliving the 97 DVD. I remember watching it for a friend's house. I thought, this is this is brilliant. Like, what, what's this team, you know? And I was playing rugby, but I didn't really understand the Lions concept. So I reckon 11, 12 years of age when the, the, probably the year after 2001, I was watching the 97 DVD and... I just thought I have to do that. You know, I just have to go on the British and Irish Lions tour. And I just think that that tour will go down in folklore, really. I think it really put the Lions on the map. It really showed what the sport is all about from camaraderie, from the fact that the performing at the highest level. And I think it was, it really put the Lions on the map. So I think all the boys, you know, so, you know, Doddy, Bentos, Gregor, like, have played a massive part. And I was chatting to Paul O'Connell and he said, exactly the same thing 97 dvd inspired him and i think all these guys who went on the 97 tour can't underestimate the effect they had on all of my generation and 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 lines generations moving forward so from that point of view it was um, a pioneering tour 
Yeah, I, th I think it was it was pioneering and it was inspirational, obviously for a generation of players, but also just for a generation of fans yeah. as well. So I think we need to put put that on record to you three and and thank you for that because there are so many people living rugby and playing rugby and watching rugby, if not if not totally uh, down to to that experience. Certainly, it played a, a massive part. Um, Dottie, we've kept you for for too long. I think. Thank you so. Oh, Ali. No, 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 no. Oh, I'm having a fast run. Ben Toss, what, what did you want to ask him? Listen, Doddy, you're not getting away so easy. No way. <laughs> I saved your life in the Philippines. I did. I really did save your life. You are one of my besties. You've got the fight of your life on your hands. We've got so much DNA, so much history. You sent me a text just as we came online to do this show. I tell you every time I see you that I love you. You've never told me in front of an audience that you love me. <laughs> you sent me a text saying, I love you, Ben Toss, with a kiss on the end. That's not good enough. I need to hear it from you. Just once. Just once. That would be, be Cathy that sent that text. Not just that day, surely. <laughs> Come on, Ben Toss. Come on. <laughs> Come on, I love you, Doddy. You know my feelings towards you. You know all the gummy out of me, you went to Philippines. You got me in the Amisha Pomo in the Philippines. You didn't tell me that was a book. Did you? <laughs> you just told me to tell you that it was a bloke eventually. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think you're going to get what you want tonight. Uh, Tells. Listen, tells me. listen, Ali. Listen, Ali. As as Sam and Greg will tell you the same. We play a sport where we don't need to use. It's like looking at each other across the street in thirty years time. I know he loves me. That's good enough. Good enough for you. Okay, it's got to be good enough, Donny. At some point, you might whisper it in his ear gently the next time you see him. Maybe I might do that. But both us and the boys and you are the biggest support us. Thank you so much for what you're doing and support. We're all in the fight to thank you, MD. And uh, we use support, we send the win to go as far as we have. I really hope that Gregor coming back from South Africa will bring some nice red wine to get in joy. I know me that we have victory. I do want to do whatever is intended. Bring it home. Brilliant. I'll, I'll get a same jersey as well for you. Don't worry. There you go. That's a thank promise. You. Doddy, thank you so, so much for freeing up your, your precious time to be with us. I know the supporters of your, your foundation are all thrilled to see you. There are lots and lots of messages coming into us here at the moment uh, as we uh, as we as we sit here um but but i think it's important that you recognize just just how how loved you are mm -hmm. and how everybody's inspired by what you're doing and how you're fighting this illness um i just want to let everybody know that there is uh, an opportunity to donate to your foundation this evening you can go to the website what my name is dotty um foundation sorry my name five dotty.co.uk is the website isn't it and they can click on the little yellow button to donate in the top right hand corner um Dottie, thank you so much for everything you've done everything you continue to do uh fighting mnd and lifting everybody's spirits every time we see you uh, keep well we'll see you soon thanks Ali. love you all on monday i'll tell you about us <laughs> 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 See you later, <laughs> Gregor. I mean, you you know that man better than most. It is extraordinary the way he has this. I, I like to describe it as a sort of ready breath glow. He has he has an amazing presence, doesn't he? A real zest for life and for living, even now in amongst this this horrible disease he's facing. Absolutely, he's he's inspirational, and I I can't believe what he's done and what he's doing in the in the face of such a debilitating disease. Uh, he has this mindset that he'll never, if he gives in a, an inch, whether that's not not walking up the stairs um, at night or getting help to his bed bedroom at night, then the disease will take over, and he's fought it for the last four years. 
and that's an inspiration to, to other people that are suffering from the disease. But he's done so much more than that. He's made M and D um, something that everybody in the, in the UK, not just in sport, aware of that there needs to be more funding going into to finding a cure. He's raised over ten million pounds, and he's put that money into to research. He's not just raising that money without a, a real intent behind it, and that's to to find a cure, um, which may happen. Um, not in his lifetime, but in in the near future. And uh, no, he's an, an inspiration. He's there's no self pity around him. You go and visit him, and he wants to to have a drink with you, have a laugh, um, talk about old times. And you no, know, he's both him and his family are are inspirational to be around. Uh, and Bentos, I, I know you guys became very very close, didn't you? In '97, you you explained that very clearly, very eloquently on on the podcast. Um, I mean, what did it mean to you at the time to have him there in the trenches with you? Uh, I love him to bits. He's, he was good at what he did. Um, I find it really hard, Ali. He's flawless as an individual. So I was I was privileged to play alongside him at Newcastle and we, we were part of an amazing tour. <clears throat> but um, I find it pretty tough. And same with Rob Burrow. Same with Rob Burrow at Leeds and... Mm. Even Derby at Man City, those three have tagged the name to the mass to, to try and raise the awareness. Well, not awareness, but just to get these people. Some guy been working on this for 25 years, and it's like, what the hell have you been doing? You know, and it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. So he ah, just, it just floors me. Yeah. Can we, yeah. We'll, yeah. we'll we'll move on. We'll move on. But but he's a, a special man. He's doing extraordinary things. So thank you all of you for for your support of him and and for everybody watching. Um, you know where to go if you need to. Uh, if you feel the need to try and help, which which would be fantastic. Um, Sam, we're going to talk a little bit about you know the current tour right now, where we are right now as we head to the second test. I mean, in 2013 against <coughs> Australia, you won the first test in the series and lost the second. In your mind, we'll hear from Gregor as to what exactly they are doing, but what is key to getting this week right? I think at this point of the tour, um, it's, I, I remember Brian Driscoll in 2013, actually. Uh, he came up to me the week of the second test and... We obviously, like, like you said, we were one nil up, and he said uh, it was his fourth tour. So he went on 2001, they lost to Australia, 2005, lost to New Zealand, nine, lost to South Africa. It was his fourth tour uh, without a victory. And he said, Oh, Warbs, you need to address the players this week and emphasize how we've got to get the job done this week because we don't want it to go to a third test, go through all that emotion again. And I was like, I completely agree, but I was like, I was 24 on my first tour. I was like, that would be so much more powerful coming from you on your fourth tour. All the guys here look up to you massively because he was one of the most senior guys in the squad. And, and he spoke brilliantly about it because it, it's hard. In, in international rugby, you could only... And, and the boys will know, you know, Gregor and Ben Doss, they, they, there's only like a handful of times a year you can really emotionally peak for, for a game like that when you there's so much pressure... So much emotion behind it. You can't do that 30 times a year. Like a, a game like a Lions Test Series game. You can't go through that 30 times a year, that roller coaster. It's only a few times. So the most important thing the Lions can do, you know, they've got all the talent in the world. They've had they, they know the calls by now. They know that they know the D setter. They know the attacking system. They know the lineup calls. You know, it, it's just getting yourself physically and mentally in the right place. And that that's why it's nice to hear that, you know, the boys are uh, Having some downtime together because now it's the hard most of the hard work's been done. You know, it's just making sure the boys are primed, ready. You tick all the boxes in training, get the tactics right, and then it's just trust the players and go and make sure you're physically and mentally right. So if they that's that's it. It's just one more eighty minute push that they need, whether it's this weekend, whether it's next weekend. You know, I'm I'm ninety nine percent certain they'll get the job done in at least one of the next two games. Um but you just got to get that bit right. Get get to that emotional peak that you've got to get to. And each player gets there differently. You know, everyone's very different. Some guys like to hibernate in their room on match day and the Friday. Other guys like to be sociable. But whatever it, whatever you do, or whatever it takes to get you to that peak, you've got to put yourself in that uncomfortable place because um, it'll only be for a short moment of time. Then when you come out the other side, you know, they'll be 
they'll be, you know, set their names in Lions history forever, in Lions folklore forever. So it's one more push, you know, but it's a, it's a massive effort, but I'm pretty, very sure that they'll do it. We'll pick up the story again in just a minute after this message from Vodafone's Lions ambassador. Hi, I'm Sam Warburton, Lions captain in 2013 and 2017. Hope you can join us ahead of this year's test matches in South Africa for Lions Live, created by Vodafone, bringing you closer to the Lions. We'll have special guests dining in from the camp and plenty of Lions legends sorting you out with pre-match analysis. For more information, download the official British and Irish Lions app powered by Vodafone and we'll see you soon for Lions Live. Gregor, the emotional peak. I mean, it's one of the great challenges, isn't it, of of a coach's career to try to bring a squad to the boil at absolutely the right moment. And you're you're in that plum seat right now. How, how are you managing to do that, or how will you manage to do that across the next couple of days? Look, I think there's there's a time to do that, and that's probably closer to kick off. I think. At this stage of the week, uh, it's about making sure that the details are. There was a, there was an edge to training on Tuesday, maybe not as much of an edge as it were mm-hmm. were a week ago, but it was still there. Um, the the session went from sort of shoulders in front, which means you you slow down the attack to full on tackling, and no one had announced it. It just happened. So uh, I think uh, but, uh, Al had got knocked back in a tackle as well and he went okay is this what's happening now um <laughs> Alan Wynn Jones that is so so that's what the last two Tuesdays have been like the the Tuesdays have came on the back of the team announcements so you you're going to get a bit of edge from those not selected but also Tuesdays are day where you can have full contact so it, it's felt like test week this week um but the, the emotional side is is really you as an individual what what brings out the best in you and as a coaching group especially the head coach what what he feels is right he may feel there's too much emotion um when we're we're having that final meeting before we get on the bus and he tries to calm it down or he may feel now's the time to ramp it up we've got to take the game to south africa we can't wait for them to come to us uh and look that's that's what's going to happen um Ventos mentioned before in, in 97 we we weren't the the better team in that second test I felt we were in the last 20 minutes of the game but we allowed South Africa to dominate physically and come at us uh, and only in the last 20 minutes we got back into the game and started going at them and we got rewards with penalties but uh, we just got that win um, and I don't want us this weekend to wait until the 60th minute to, before we start going at them Attack wise, obviously that's your your remit. I mean, this second test is it a little bit more strategic? You've made those tweaks, those changes um, with the three players coming in, and do you feel that in the course of the the first test, particularly the the second half, that you kind of almost found the blueprint as to exactly how to overcome the box? I mean, you were trying to go a little wider earlier, weren't you? And then you just tightened the game and squeezed them. In a greater fashion, is that is that the way that this is going to be done? Do you think? Yes, I, look, I think it's it's not as simplistic as that. I think um, the, the the first twenty more minutes of any test match is is usually um, more conservative, whether that's a Six Nations game or or a, a Lions Test series, especially when you're playing against a conservative team like the, like the Springboks. You've got to create opportunities and you've got to take the right opportunities at any time. You can't wait for for the second half to that to happen. We didn't have as many in the first half. We had one, one decent one about the midway through the first half and one just before half time when Robbie Henshaw came through. But what, what we found in the second half is that we, um, we exited much better. So uh, after our restarts, Ali Price's um, kicks were, were excellent. Actually reminded me, but Duan van der Merwe had a couple of tackles just after um, uh, the number eight caught the ball. That remind me of the second test, 
I don't want to flatter him too much, but John Bentley uh, had a couple of beauties in that second test with Matt Dawson's uh, box kicks. And not only did this, did it win us back possession, but the psychological boost you get when your exits are turning into to huge gains, um, that's what flipped the game, I think. But um, the way the the way the forwards carried in that second half got got us lots of rewards. It, cre- it started creating up a bit more space, but we started to get penalties too. Uh, I would like those those opportunities to turn into line breaks and to turn into tries. But at test matches, if you're getting three points um, or an opportunity to kick to the corner like we did in the second half, then that's sometimes all all you need to to win the game. And obviously, you know, given that we're reflecting on '97 and applying it to 2021 as best we can, uh, it, is it something that you're drawing upon in any regard? I remember as part of the podcast, we heard really vividly, <clears throat> particularly from Scott Gibbs, from Bentos, from Neil Jenkins, uh, and from Woody about the crazy nature of that atmosphere appreciated with fans as opposed to without in Durban at the start of that second test. And actually Scott Gibbs had to call everybody in because he felt that minds were being lost and they were getting caught up in the moment, himself included, and that it actually needed to be taken by the scruff of the neck at, at that point. Now appreciate the, there aren't going to be the fans in the, in the ground to, to produce that sort of atmosphere necessarily, but the, the fire and the fury of a, of a, a spring bot that's been beaten last week, we all know, well, we think we know what that's going to mean, don't we? Are you in any way channeling your inner 1997 ahead of this week, Gregor? Well, you know, I've, I've actually thought about it today. Uh, I've, I've attack presentations tomorrow, so <laughs> I've, I've got to talk to the, uh, the team about attack and what, what we're aiming to do. And I have thought about talking about 97 and being myself and Jenks are here, being in that, that situation where... We, we made errors and we let them come to us and we, we can't let that happen uh, on Saturday. So it has been in my mind. I think I think 97 is, is ancient history to a, lot, to a lot of the players, but a lot of them um, know it very well through uh, through watching the, the video back in the day. So I'll, I'll, w- I'll wake up in the morning then t- and decide whether I'm going to talk about that or not. But the, the lack of crowds, I think, is an advantage for, for us it's it's a real um, disappointment for for our players not to play in front of crowds, especially with what the Lions has, has become over the last few years. There's wall-to-wall rugby on TV here, and they keep replaying the 2009 series, and just seeing the amount of red jerseys in the crowds for those those games is is amazing. And the the energy the the box got off the crowd, the, the, and the atmospheres were amazing. Whereas now we we've now played South Africa arguably two times in the stadium. We played the, the A team and then the first test last week. And it's it's the voices of the players you hear and the voices of the, the support staff. So it's really a neutral ground. Uh, the, so the, the, sprung, the spring box are not going to get the energy from the crowd. So we've got to make sure they don't, they don't get into the game just by winning the collisions, especially early on in the game. Uh, Ali, can I ask Gregor a question, please? Please do. Yeah, do you mind? Sorry, I'm, I'm, but but Gregor, I mean, you've you you you've you've gone from playing. You talk about nine seven. Let's use ex, nine seven as an example of playing to coaching. Transform the Scotland team seriously. Sam will agree with that. You have transformed the Scotland team, and then you're suddenly on the Lions tour, which is dream come true. <sighs> which is easiest? You're preparing for the second test. You prepared. 24 years ago to go out and play the second test. You're now preparing players to go and play in the second test. Which, which of the two, because actually as a coach, you can, you can, you can obviously share all your, all your qualities, everything you've got, all your knowledge. But once you walk across the white line, you have little say in the outcome, actually. You have a little bit of a say at half time and then perhaps full time. Which are you probably enjoying most as a player or being a coach? Well, which is easiest is um, the answer is assistant coach. That's for sure. <laughs> I think <laughs> being head head coach is um, is very difficult uh, because you got so many things going through your mind that you have to deal with. Um, so I've, I've enjoyed being assistant coach on this on this tour. And the most the most difficult, but the most rewarding is being a player. There's, there's a group of players that have to have the disappointment of 
of not being involved this weekend. All the coaches are involved in every game, so you, you don't get that disappointment. Uh, but the, the rewarding thing is being out there and having a real um, effect uh, on the game and and sharing that moment with your, your teammates after. You, you're, you're part of the group as a coach and you love being in the change room and you've seen the joy that the players face and seeing them achieve their potential. But you, you know that the... Um, you know the feeling the players have is is uniquely to them, and you miss it. But it's great seeing them enjoying it. Sorry, Ali. Sorry. No, don't, don't apologise, um, Gregor. I'm, I'm intrigued as well. I, I think there'll be a lot of romantics who will have enjoyed the podcast because it's leaning heavy on nostalgia, quite obviously. And you, you've mentioned the emotional peaks that are required, and Sam has touched upon that as well. Um, we saw that, didn't we, in 97, very clearly, all those pressure points that were touched by Geach and Jim Telfer, those extraordinary epic speeches. Um, do those sort of words still hit the mark now, 24 years on? Is that something that, that Warren Gatlin delivers, that, that you deliver? Um, how, I mean, how was the halftime talk last week, for instance? And do, do those things still happen, those sort of set piece you know, sit down, hairs on the back of your neck type moments or not? They do, um, but you're, you're talking about two speeches that are they're the, high, the highest level ever, like um, Jim's every speech and Geechee's speech before the, the second test was, uh, was incredible. But, uh, the themes he touched on, but also that <clears throat> personal connection and the foresight he had, um, with what he delivered, so yeah, you, you get them. Um, Gats has the as as a head coach, he will come in on the back um, of what a what a defence coach does. Steve presented yesterday. My presentation presentation is tomorrow, so he'll he'll either come and re-emphasise some points or have his own uh, points um, more globally to talk about. He he speaks to the players on the day of the game, and <clears throat> I thought he spoke really. <clears throat> Excuse me. He spoke really well last Saturday. He spoke really well on um, on selection night as well, um, and there was a bit of edge around what he talked about about making sure we have a big week because there's opportunities for for the squad next week. So those that are not selected will have to front up a uh, training to turn those opportunities next week. Uh, so yeah, it's it's probably not. I don't think the length of speeches are are there like they used to be. Um, there's different ways of communicating now, whether it's use of themes. We had a theme last week around um, Ali and Foreman and the rumble in the jungle and how we can drain the energy of the spring box and then and put them away like Ali had done. So you, you, you're trying to get those connections, engagement, and possibly different ways than, than the, the, the classic speeches of old. And Sam, I mean, obviously you have enormous experience of, of Warren Gatland, both with Lyon and, and with Wales. In in your mind, is, is that one of his big strengths, the way he motivates mm -hmm. Wales? Yeah, what I like about um, Warren is he doesn't raise his voice. Like Greg said, he's a very relaxed coach. But when he when he speaks, I, used to, I, I remember the team meetings, you know, when the players meet up to before they go on the bus, like it was yesterday. But I think his biggest strength is, and how he does it, I don't know, it's obviously his delivery, and I genuinely believe it, but whatever he tells you that's going to happen, you sit there and you just, you 100% believe it, you know, and, and everyone believes it. it's a very, you know, if he sat down and said and told the players that they're more gifted, they're more physical, they're fitter, they're better, they've been through more bigger games, like you sit there, you say, yeah, we have. You know, and, and it just fills everyone with confidence and he's very calm, very assertive. It doesn't go kicking bins over and swearing. And But I just think when he talks, you just 100% believe, 100 believe what he says. And it rubs off on the whole squad. You know, it does. It's a very, it's not arrogance, um, very fine line between arrogance and confidence. But if if players said in a press conference where they were really believing in their minds, you, you come across as arrogant. But you're not. That's just the mindset you have to have to play at that level. Like, you'll be modest in front of the cameras and you'll be respectful to the opposition. But in your own mind, and when the players are talking to each other, they got no other intention but to, to really physically do a job on South Africa. And it's like the most negative thing people can say when they say they have to match the Springbok physicality or they have to match their intensity. That's like, no, straight away you're on the, you're on the back foot. 
they need to match us. Like, you know, you can't talk like that. But that's how the guys and gats will talk behind closed doors. It just fills you with confidence, you know, when the Lions are number one. South Africa have got to beat us. You know, we don't have to prove anything to beat them. We should beat South Africa. We're the best players from four nations. We should win. That's how it should be. So don't be surprised by that. So, you know, I like that pressure that he puts on the players, that expectation to win, and you genuinely believe it. Brilliant. Um, Gregor, I know we've got to let you go. I've got a couple of sort of quicker fire questions just to throw at you before you turn your attention to the attack presentation, which is infinitely more significant than important. <laughs> you recognise that. Um, firstly, I mean, the, the pitch was a bit of a shambles the other night, wasn't it? it sort of rolled up like a carpet. Is that going to survive a second outing on, <laughs> on Saturday? Well, it's been better weather this week. So the, the weather leading up to the test last week was, was horrendous on the, the Tuesday, Wednesday. So maybe, um, but we we played there a couple of times and we're still slipping around. Uh, and the players said they put extra long studs in for the for the game at the weekend. So yeah, it, look, it's it's not not the greatest pitch in the world. Um, and a, a lot of that is down to kickoff time. So um, just around six o'clock, there's a, there's a dew comes on the on the pitch. Even though it's been great great weather during the day, it's meant to be twenty degrees again this weekend. But uh, the ball's going to be wet and the pitch is going to be slippery. But um, it's, it's not too bad. It's not as bad as um, Scotland in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do have that to measure it against. Um, and another quick one for you. How much are you enjoying the um, the, the Razi Erasmus and his burner Twitter account? <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> I, I, I laughed so much this week. Watch it. It's, it's great. Um, no, it's, it's a nice little distraction that's going on there. I don't think we'd ever thought this would be talking about this. It's extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, do do you feel it is? Do, do you feel it's a, actually a distraction technique on, on the part of the box because it's just entertaining everybody, or is there something deeper to it? Or are you you're not even thinking that deep? No, you'd have you'd have to ask them, but um, it does seem a little bit bizarre that <laughs> burner Twitter accounts and messages getting sent out. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I've seen that before, so it's it's unique anyway. It's mad, isn't it? Um, and just quickly, you've you've obviously had an interesting time of it, haven't you? Personally, out there because you were you were stuck in in Joburg in your hotel room, struggling, and now you're fit and healthy and back with everybody, which is brilliant, of course. But there there must have been some some funny moments, some kind of crazy moments. Um, do, do you want to just try and pick one out that, that perhaps sticks in your mind from the last couple of weeks? Well, there were there were five of us in Joburg. Um... Uh, one one player, Stuart Hogg, so he was the unfortunate one. The rest of us were um, uh, an analyst, myself, and two of the documentary film crew. So um, Stuart Hogg obviously was the most important out of the, out of the group. So yeah, it was uh, it wasn't the best getting your, your food delivered in your your room um, for a few days when the players left us uh, the squad left us on the sunday we were in joburg for another three or four days um, but at least then we were able to to have a walk outside of our rooms the i suppose one of the for really frustrating nights but i want to look back at it now it's quite funny um i missed two games so that was incredibly frustrating um not being there on 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 game day uh and this is the first first game didn't go that great from my point of view because i'm watching it on on TV and the um, um, not being able to com communicate that well with the, the coaches. The second game was much better. So um, I had all these different angles in my room. I was communicating with the coaches direct. So any messages were passed on, but I'd set up with Dan Bigger at halftime um, to chat to him. Um, but the analyst phone suddenly was out. He, I was phoning him and I'd phoned Dan um, he didn't pick up his phone at halftime. Obviously, had other things to do, so I did feel a little bit right. I'm getting ignored here. I've got all these great ideas for them at halftime, but uh, no, I was very happy to be back for the the South Africa A game. That was when I was allowed back into camp. Mad, absolutely mad. Listen, what, one final thing, just to take us back to '97 before we let you go. Obviously. Uh, we we remember the final moments of that second test in 97 so well, the Guscott drop goal, obviously. But we asked all our interviewees in the podcast to kind of guide us through those last few minutes. And so we've got some really um, interesting different takes on who did what and where and how. And obviously, memories are a little bit blurry from time to time. Um, but would you like to just guide us through um, those those final 
few moments from your perspective because you actually played a really important role in the setup for the drop goal, which under normal circumstances you might very well expect the fly half to actually execute. So it might yeah. have been your name up in lights rather than <clears throat> Can you explain to us why that was? Yeah, I think I played an important role by not being there for the drop goal. <laughs> that was very important. Uh, I did ha actually. Um, I wonder whether I would have gone for the drop goal or not. But the week before, I had, or two weeks before, I had knocked over a drop goal on the same ground. But uh, anyway, the um, I do remember it was a great turnover, and we kicked the ball up the field. Keith Wood chased after it, and we got a line out in the twenty-two. We got Mall going forward, and at that stage, you're probably looking for a penalty off off a Mall. But the Mall was edging forward, and there was a gap starting to appear between the edge of the Mall and the first defender. A standoff, but there was a flanker um, just at the, uh, the, the side of the mall, so he was probably going to defend that space. But Tim Rodber grabbed him and pulled him into the mall, and I'm screaming at Matt Dawson to give him the ball because there's now a space for me to go for that gap. So um, I did take the gap. Tim Rodber had a massive black eye after the game because as he was pulling Andre Venter into the, the line at mall, he turned around and whacked him. Uh, and I think it was him that ended up just grabbing me, but he didn't. He didn't bring me down, and I made probably the best decision I've made in my playing career because I could see the try line about three or four yards away. I thought, do I try and grab and reach for the the try line, but it's quite risky, um, or do I just present the ball back? So I decided to present the ball back, and obviously the rest is history. Okay. I would, I would argue, I, I like I. Like Jenks had moved into the ten position, he was a fullback, and when he saw me go for the 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 gap, he dropped behind the the, the ruck, which is the best position to drop a goal. I'm sure Doss looked at him, but then looked up at Jerry, who was much flatter, more chance of getting charged down. But he, he chose the right one. I'm sure Jenks would have knocked it over, but I were delighted when that went through the post. And you and you and did you see the ball sail through the post from your position at the bottom of the ruck, or you didn't see it at no, all? No, no, no. I was about three, four bodies on top of me, so <laughs> <laughs> didn't see it. Ask Gregor a question, are we? Before he by all means, yes. He's got some very important work to do, though, Bento. So you better be quick. <laughs> Just we go back a long way. We haven't spent a lot of time in each other's company prior. Never, never met prior to '97. Only met on several occasions. Since what I will say, the last time I was in your company, we were in a departure lounge about to fly to Hong Kong, and your face dropped when I walked into the lounge because you look at me thinking, Oh god, 14 hours with fucking Bentos. <laughs> <laughs> Did you really think that oh, please for me to be sad? No, not at all. I think you've read a bit too much into that. <laughs> You you were up in business class anyway. I think I was down in the economy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well done, Mike. Well done, Brilliant. Um, Gregor, we better let you go. You've got some important things to do. So, listen, very, very best of luck to, to you and to everybody for Saturday. Uh, you know the support that's back here willing you on. So uh, go, go get the job done, would you? That would be helpful. Thank you very much for your time. Really, really appreciate it. No worries. Thank you, guys. Great seeing you all. Cheers, Gregor. Good luck, mate. Thanks, Gregor. So, um, guys, we just got the the last kind of ten minutes or so, Ben. So, what what is it you wanted to get into? Yeah, I tell you what, it's going to get really interesting. You got rid of the Scots boys now. You got a Welshman and an Englishman. <laughs> <laughs> got rid of the Scots. Yeah, I'm not talking. Go on, what mate. Possibly go wrong. Is it worth talking about one or two of the characters on on the trip? I mean, there there are so many extraordinary players out there right now. Um, ben, so we'll talk about some of the wingers, maybe, and. and Perhaps now Greg is gone. We can talk about the fact we haven't seen a whole lot of attacking rugby. Certainly in the in the first test, it was it was cagey, wasn't it? Someone like Cheslin Colby, he, he touched the ball what four or five times last week. Um, he probably saw it more falling from the sky than he did through the hands. What, what's your, what's your take on the wingers out there? Yeah, oh, 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 mate. wingers are there just to finish, are they, and get the opportunities? The interesting thing though, as well, is Sam, you've got Sam as well. Sorry, Ali, I'm not really probably going to answer your question, actually. Looking back at 97, extremely happy to her. You know, we were allowed to go out, we could do what we wanted and whatever. You look at Sam's two tours, and the integral thing about being a successful, uh, having a successful tour party is everybody getting on as one, becoming one team. This team, this group, um, 
they can't go out. And actually, it, it's probably more important on this trip that they get on because they're in each other's pockets and they can't escape, can they? Um, it, it's really interesting, the dynamics. Are, but anyway, to answer your question, um, wingers, the Welsh boy, man. The Welsh, Sam, the, the Welsh lad who scored all the tries. God, he must be absolutely bloody spewing. <laughs> it's a, it's can, a can you imagine, point. Sam? Can you imagine if John Bentley had scored eight tries for the Lions ahead of the first <laughs> test and wasn't picked like Josh Adams? Can you imagine the stink? Oh, <laughs> I, can, I can imagine Bentos going to Geech's bedroom and fly kicking the door down at 11 o'clock at night <laughs> asking him what's going on. <laughs> oh, Josh, Josh, he's a little girl, isn't he? Yeah. He's yeah. A, little, a little girl. I knew a baby, but. He's not being picked for the first and second test. You know, this is a single cynical part of my head, which, which will say, "Do you know what? I wish I'd have stayed at home and see my daughter being born. He'll be, he'll be, he'll be dirty. Actually, I, I thought he'd have got to run. Actually, mm. do you think he deserved to? Be, do you think he deserved to be picked, Sam? I always knew uh, people were looking at like certain positions, but I thought that back three. How are you going to pick in that between that back three was always going to be ridiculous. People have been saying Van der Merwe was a um, was a, a bolter going to the tour. Anyone who's watched Edinburgh for the last twelve months would never have said he was a bolter. He's been phenomenal for Edinburgh in the Pro 14. He's been brilliant for Scotland. So for me, Van der Merwe had to go on tour and was a serious test starter. So. I'm not, I'm not trying to say this in hindsight now he's picked, like, oh, I knew, but only because I've actually watched more Pro 14 than other people because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm Welsh. So I knew of Van der Merwe. Watson, for me, has been England's best player in the last 12 months. Yeah. So I knew Watson had to start. Um, and then you've got Scotland captain Stuart Hogg, Mr. Dependable under the high ball, Liam Williams, and uh, and the most prolific try scorer, Josh Adams. I thought, five don't fit into three. There's going to be two massive omissions and... I understand because Watson, I think, is very versatile across the back three. Van der Merwe brings a physicality which none of the others bring as well, which I think the Lions have, have, have needed as well. And Gatlin loves that. If you look at the past tours, you know, players who featured, you've had like, look at 13, you had Tommy Bowe, Cuthbert, George North, you know, big, big wingers. And Gatlin likes that. Probably didn't have that as disposable, a disposal in 17. Yeah. as much as he has now. So now he's got at his disposal, he's gone straight back to it. So I think if Gatlin's got the opportunity to pick a big, powerful wing, he's going to pick it. So it was probably a hit out between uh, Watson and Adams because he feels he needs to have that size in the back three somewhere. So um, tough call, tough call. I do really feel for Josh Adams on another tour. He, he could yeah. be a tech starter. Um, Sam, what do you make of the uh, the changes that, that Warren Gatlin's mm -hmm. made? Um, uh, is it instructive as well that the, the, the back row's left intact they brought Falatau of course onto the bench but but it's the the, the box who've made the change in the back row Quagga Smith is is out and Jasper Visa's in what, what's your take on all of that yeah I, I wouldn't have expected any any changes in the pack really you know watching the game back again I thought the pack did what they were meant to do particularly in the second half I understand the Mako Vernapola and I agree with the Mako Vernapola coming in because he was just more solid in the scrum if we're being honest between himself and Sutherland so uh, Vernapola had a bit more dominance in the scrum. He brings obviously a bit more experience, a bit more physicality as well. So um, I think that's 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 really understandable. I think Daly was an experiment in the set, not experiments. He's proven on that Lions tour at thirteen. But even though we didn't have much international experience, the Lions South Africa A showed a lot of space out wide, a lot in, defensively. So I think Daly was a a tactic to try and get there. And Gatlin said in his post match interview. We tried a bit too hard first half. And I think he was alluding to they tried to find that space out wide, which wasn't on. Instead, then second half, they went pragmatic. Like we see a lot um, with many teams now in Sasha Rugby, they just wanted to win the airspace, the, the kicking battle up, up top. And they did. That's, that, that's what won them 30, 40 yards of possession. You can either play into a Springbok blitz defence, um, run down a dark alley, or you can just kick to compete. It's, it's a much more energy efficient, uh, cost effective way of playing and it worked and when they got in within 30 yards of the South African line every time they kept the ball for more than five phases they got a penalty and that was the game plan second half you know when the South Africans were tiring so I think what was plan B on the first test which was what I just explained will now become plan A 
Uh, plan A didn't quite work, I think, uh, and now they, you know, that now they'll slightly tweak their game plan and, and go for the same again on the weekend. Bentos, um, what are your expectations for for Cape Town on Saturday, and where will you be watching it? I'll be somewhere in South Wales, actually. Uh, would you believe? Uh, do you know Neil Boobier, um, Sam? Yeah, I know Boobs. Yeah, I know him very well. So I'm doing a lunch on Friday. I should have been in South Africa now. I should have been there. You know, I, I enjoying you know on the waterfront in, in, in Cape Town and what have you. But, um, yeah, I'm going to be in South Wales. So, in Bridge End, I think, on Friday. And then uh, that's somewhere in South Wales. I don't know where. Uh, <laughs> it's all the same. Until the next Wednesday. I mean, I'll probably get out by the Wednesday. But um, it could be... Uh, only through experience. Uh, second test. Wow. It'd be just... It'll be just crazy. They, they'll be going through the ringer this week. The South Africans still are being put through the ringer. It's the current world champions, as they were in '97. Um, it means so much to them, and it's actually a massive. Because Sam would have been playing on this tour, Ali, if he'd have been still playing the sport, he'd have probably been captain as well. Uh, he'd have been on this trip, and I'm just disappointed for him that he didn't play in South Africa. He's had two great experiences in Australia and New Zealand. But South Africa's different. It's, a, it's the next level. But then again, it's a little bit diluted because there are no supporters and, and they're not allowed to experience the, the atmosphere of the you know the, of the country. But, God, it'd be crazy in that the Lions have just got to... I remember 2013, uh, 2013 in Australia when you were captain, Sam, when we won, I say we, I use the word we in a very loose term, you won the first test and then it was a real struggle in the second test but I always remember Gats in the third test there was a big dispute about um, O'Driscoll getting dropped and it was the weekend when uh, there's a boy who'd been Scottish uh, uh, he's Scottish all his life and he's British for two years uh, two weeks of the year uh, and then it, 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 from that, that weekend that very same weekend when Gats picked all the Welsh boys to play um, there were 13 Welsh boys who started that third test to win the Test Series. Uh, Andy Murray won at uh, Wimbledon. He'll be busy for the rest of his life now. He'll never be Scottish ever again. Um, it, it, it's about... They've got to win the Test. They've got to win the game. Um, and it's about putting the side out to win the game. They're going to come at... They'll come at the lines 100, 100 mile an hour, Ali. Yeah, I think that's, that's very clear. Sam, quick prediction. I think uh, South Africa will be absolute rampant first 20, 30 minutes. And I think if the Lions can go in half time within five, seven points, they'll have enough to win the game. I think South Africa will empty, throw the kitchen sink at the Lions. They'll come back. They'll hit that emotional peak. It'll be almost damage control for the first 20 minutes. But then if the Lions are within five, seven points, they'll run away with it. They've got too much class. They play too much international rugby compared to South Africa, who are really missing that firepower in the last twenty minutes. Not this, I don't mean from the bench. It's the biggest difference between the two sides going into this tour is the lack of international intensity South Africa have experienced, and that's why the Lions had to win first up because South Africa will only get better. I know they've been playing rugby South Africa, but Rainbow Cup it is no disrespect is nowhere near a Lions Test match, and I think you could see that. That's why they were giving away. Penalties, they were ill disciplined, normally down to fatigue, poor decisions. So the Lions bench will be better than any bench in World Rugby, given the player pool we've got to pick from. If the Lions are within a score at half time, um, I see them winning by about seven points. Okay, <laughs> you heard it here first. Brilliant, guys. Thank you so, so much. It's shaping up, isn't it, to be an epic day of rugby. We all wish the Lions well, perhaps. Uh, those listening and watching can get themselves in the mood by listening to episode nine of Inside the Tour, uh, which is the second test from 97. It's a cracker. Great insights from uh, the likes of Neil Jenkins, Scott Gibbs, Keith Wood, Geech, uh, Bentos himself, of course. So we'll find out who the heroes of, of 2021 might be. Um, thank you so much to both of you for giving up your, your precious time. Um, Sam, good luck with the commentary on Saturday. Try and avoid Nigel Lowen's talking all over the re the actual referee. I'm um, very I'm very lucky, Ali, that I've learned from the best from yourself at BT Sport <laughs> for the last three years. So I've had a very good mentor. Uh, I'll tease you up beautifully for that. Um, <laughs> and plus, thank you so much. Enjoy your trip to South Wales. I'm sure they will afford you all, all the best sort of hospitality. Good, mate.
Um, oh. Thank you very, very much. And once again, huge thanks to our public uh, publishers, Audi, uh, to our sponsors, Vodafone, and to Dottie's incredible MND Foundation. Please head to their website uh, to donate if you feel you're able to. £6 million they've raised at this point uh, for research into a cure and a further £1 million to help those suffering with the disease at the moment. Every penny counts. So thank you very, very much in advance for that. Really hope you've enjoyed the evening. Thank you for being with us. Good night. If you've loved hearing about the Lions of 1997, check out the critically acclaimed book, This Is Your Everest, by Tom English and Peter Burns, the inside story of the 1997 Lions tour to South Africa, told by the players, coaches and managers on both sides. Insightful, funny, spine-tingling and full of raw emotion, it explores the tour in new depth to make it the perfect accompaniment to this podcast, Living With Lions, and the 2021 Lions tour to South Africa. Alex Corbusera here, former British and Irish Lions rugby player and proud ASM Scholarships ambassador, telling you all to check out ASM Scholarships. At ASM, we connect rugby athletes with universities in America that provide sports scholarships. Apply today at asmscholarships.com for your free assessment to see what universities you qualify to.